Welcome back folks. We are doing an extra video this week. Uh, because it's been a really interesting learning experience resulting in probably the most useless little project which I'm going to call Snakey and I wanted to share it with everyone. Now if you're into programming, uh, SBCs, microprocessors or even just digital circuits then hang around as we're going to be doing some initial FPGA programming on the Beagle V Fire uh, that I looked at in my last video or the video before my last video. And then we're going to go a bit past what the documentation here has in it and explain a bit more of the sim syntax and some slightly more complex logic and operation. Uh, finally, if you want to hang around to the end, I'm going to give away three Cypede Tang Nano kits. Um, so I'll put a picture up here, but it's these things. Uh, Tang Nano 9K, yeah, that's the one. So uh, these little kits I'm going to give away include a color LCD display, HDMI interface, uh, heaps of GPOs, uh, and I'll give three of them away. I considered getting the 4K and then I thought, nah, 9K is the way to go. Um, it doesn't have the built-in camera uh, or the Cortex Core, but it does have nearly 9K of logic units and it's got built-in flash and you've got a few different options there and it also takes an SD card. So awesome stuff, going to give them away, hang around to the end. Until then, let's get into it. Now, just to give you a heads up, not everything in this video is gonna be perfect. I'm actually really new to Verilog and I've less than 30 days practice at getting it wrong so far. So just forgive me if I make some mistakes, but if you do know better, definitely leave a comment and I'll add any correction uh, into the description to help others. If after this video, you'll also want to continue learning more about this, I'd really recommend a Skillshare class from Ajat Shatru Misha, if I get that right. Um, is a data scientist who presents a course that covers logic gates and Boolean algebra. So I'll link to it up here and I'll put a link in the description below. So check it out. And at the same time, you'll be supporting his class and this channel. So now onto the Beagle V Fire. As I've got here, it's the same one as before. I stuck a heatsink on now and it's plugged in with USB for power and LAN so I can SSH to it. Um, I was also uh, completely dumb in my last video when I was trying to get the temperature of the MCU because, well, it's reflective and I didn't think about putting a bit of tape or something on top, the infrared was reflecting. So the, the MCU does get pretty hot, always slap a heat sink and fan on there if you can for best performance. Now this Beagle V Fire, it's got a FPGA fabric called the Polar Fire, it's uh, got some specs here. So it's the Microchip Polify MPFS 025T. Um, it's got 23,000 logic elements with four input lookup tables and DFFs. It's got a bunch of other things as well spread around such as inputs, memory and everything like that. And it's got access to the reset button, the M2 interface, the Sysigy interface, GPOs, onboard LED, uh, the MIPI CSI and some other bits which you'll find in the block diagram. If we go back and have a look here, it gives you a pretty good layout. It is worth noting though, that this does appear to be slightly wrong. So from what I found, this user reset button doesn't actually connect to HSIO. That actually connects to MSSIO, well, the, the user button. So we can access reset uh, through one of the signals, but we can't actually access the user button. Um, and now 23,000 logic elements isn't huge, but it's not small. So there's things like the tiny BX, the tan nano and whatnot, and they're all in the 1000 to 25,000 range. Uh, but then you do get some, some megas and the, uh, the megas might be 120,000 logic elements. Right now though, we're taking the open source and the risk five approach. And for 150 bucks, this thing's excellent. Now, as far as actually making it do something, you can build or synthesize your HDL into a bitstream and reprogram this FPGA using cables and adapters that connect to that JTAG and their software, which is expensive, but you can get a license for it. Or you can actually just use the Beagle board CI slash CD infrastructure that they provide and flash it from the board itself, which makes it really, really easy. Um, so we'll open up their guide. We'll, we'll go through this because there are a few gotchas and we'll get started and actually flash uh, our own code to it eventually. First thing though worth noting is that you will need to request access. So if we go across to the gateway repository, which is here and you don't have that fork button, you're gonna have to go onto the forums, which they've got down here and just 
put a post up, ask for access. That's automatic and that's to stop the spam. Now I also want to say I did get Wi-Fi working. So I've taken the M2 card out now. It turns out it was just the gateway version that I had was 0.3.0, I think. Uh, and that was a little bit old. And the image actually comes with gateway built into it. So if you go to user share Beagleboard, have a look in here, there's a gateway folder. If you go into that gateway folder, you can see there's a script there and there's a couple of different versions of the gateway. And you can literally just go dot slash change gateway default. And that's gonna flash the default gateway for you. Um, there is also a command to check which version of the gateway you've got. I always forget what that is. So if we grab that and we go cat, uh, default, we can see now we've got the Beagle 5 Fire 040 and that's the commit or a slightly mingled version of the commit number there. So you can check what you've got. If you've got 030, you might have some issues like I did. This is working fine now though. Now, let's get into this documentation. It gives you a pretty good uh, overview of everything you need to do, but as I said, there are a few steps uh, that they don't really outline very well. So first of all, request access in the support forums here. They've actually got a thread that people keep asking for it on. And then once you've got that access, you'll find that you've got this fork button here. So first off, create a fork. I'm gonna call this one Snakyware, and it's gonna be under my namespace. Now, if you wanna make it private or internal, the build's gonna fail. And that's because the runner that does the build doesn't actually have access to, uh, you know what? That probably helps you a bit, doesn't it? Uh, doesn't have access to your code. So leave it as public. That's, that's the best way to go for the sake of forking this. Get rid of some of these extra tabs. And it steps you through this. So you pick a name, it'll automatically generate the slug, pick your namespace, go public, and then once you've got this, you'll want to grab that link and we'll go back to our home directory and go git clone. Now, if you haven't used git before, I'm actually working on the Beagle 5 Fire here, um, but if you haven't set it yet, you will need to set your name and email address. That can be configured in here and it will warn us about it eventually anyway. Um, next step is we're gonna need to go into this YAML file and change the name there. Um, let's go have a look at that. Cool, we've got Snakyware. So VI custom FPGA design, my custom. You can use whatever editor you want. This is just what I prefer. So I'm gonna go M2, I'll leave that none, just so it's uh, faster to compile. Otherwise it takes about seven minutes. If you add default there, this should only take four minutes. Cape option, snakyware, because that's what I'm gonna call it. Save and quit. Now you can see here, they do have little annotations uh, next to everything that they note. And it's worth noting, as they say here, that that folder kind of has a special meaning, gets picked up by the infrastructure and that's how it knows to compile it. Now, if we go, in here, components. We have the cape folder, which is what we want. And we're gonna copy the very log template to a folder called Snakyware. And that is matching the name that I just put in the YAML file before, which is really important. Now, if we go into Snakyware, that's all correct. We're gonna have to have a look here, go into this add cape. And this is what's stitching all the different bits of very log together. So I'm just gonna copy and paste that top one and just gonna add my own file here. That file doesn't exist yet, that's perfectly fine, but it just means here uh, that's essentially how it should be. <coughs> Pardon me. So now we can grab their default code. If we go into our Snakyware folder and paste that in, that all looks pretty straightforward. The timescale bit at the start doesn't actually really matter much. That's more for when you're simulating it. But we've got a module here called Blinky. We'll leave that as Blinky for now, we'll change it later. We've got our input from our clock and our reset button. The end means it's pulled higher by default, so kind of inverted, and we're outputting to blink. We've then got 23 bits as a counter. 
we're assigning the LED input, uh, uh, sorry, output that we've called blink to the 23rd part, because it says zero based array to the 23rd part. And what we're doing here is at the positive edge of the clock at the negative edge of the reset button. If it's not reset, so if it's gone zero, then reset the counter. Now, this is a, uh, a non-blocking assignment. So, or blocking, I forget which one it is. Anyway, this basically means it's gonna wait for everything else to be complete before it executes that. So you, you're not assigning something in the wrong state. We've got, uh, we're gonna have 16 bits hex value zero that we're assigning. Otherwise, if it's not the reset, then add one to the counter. Now, you can also cheat a little bit here as well with most uh, compilers or synthesizers. You only need the begin and end if you've got more than one line. Um, or you might need the begin and end for uh, this compiler, but theoretically in Verilog, you could also just go like this as well um, because it's nice and short. And everything is usually spaced like this, as you can see. So it's kept um, indented and aligned nicely just so that, there we go, uh, so that things kind of look easy, easy to the eyes. I'm crapping on now, I'm gonna cut this out. So we've pasted that in. There are a few more things that we need to do though. They kind of go through a bit of this here, but the first one will be in the HDL file, we have this cape.v and at the very bottom, we actually need, like what these other ones are doing, is to instantiate a version of Blinky. So we'll go Blinky and this version we're gonna call Blinky zero. And now we have to tie some inputs and they've got them here. So, uh, if I'll just copy and paste that, it's not gonna come across quite right, but that'll do. There we go. It's having a hard time with those Unicode characters. Now, what this is tying to, we can see further up, preset n is part of this cape module. Uh, so further up the food chain, that's also gonna be tied to something. And you can see there's a bit of code here that, you know, it grabs that at a few different places, but it is defined as part of the Cape module. They do say though, that we also need to go and grab some other bits. So we've got this net assignment here, uh, which is just concatenating some bits and some wires, and we're gonna grab the middle of it. Uh, I grab the, the sixth place or the seventh place from the middle of it. So if we go to where this is, all right. So what we're gonna be doing here is hijacking it a little bit. Um, if we put this to the side and have a look at what they're doing, they are essentially grabbing all of these output enable pins and chopping them up. Um, what did I just do? I undid that. So, so if we go back to these concatenation assignments, we've got this one here. And what we're gonna wanna do, th these operators are concatenating multiple parts together and the array starts at the end. So this is in the zeroth place, this is in the last place essentially. What we wanna do here is add one bit of one to the middle and then we're gonna make this an array. So we're gonna uh, take whatever the actual values were from the zeroth place up to the uh, fourth place and then we're gonna stick a one. So that's output enabled on, uh, on the sixth place essentially or fifth if you count from zero. And then we're gonna be really similar here. So if we take those, um, we're gonna do something a little bit sneaky here. So we've gotta grab the top end of that too. So output enable. So it's gonna be, uh, what is it? We've got zero, three, four, and then that's the fifth. And then right here, like there shows, we wanna go all the way up to 27, which is the top and from six. So we are concatenating, if I can make this window a little bit bigger. There we go. Um, the first five bits, then our forcefully enabled one, then the rest of the bits. And we'll do the same down here. So we're gonna go Jeep every time. So back to where we were, we wanna go GPO out 27, six now here we're going to use the blink wire that we defined below and grab the rest of those we do actually need to create that blink wire too so if we go to where that 
uh, preset end wire is defined, and we can just create blink. So we're creating a wire called blink in the cape module. We're then forcefully enabling the output on the sixth line. We're concatenating that wire into the array. And then we're also linking it to this instantiated blinky that we've got there, if that makes sense. That, um, this might make more sense. The documentation might make more sense, but that's how my brain does it. Um, that's, yeah, that, that should make sense to you. It makes sense to me. Now, the last thing we want to do after we've saved that is modify the overlay. Um, now, I can't actually remember where that was, so we'll... Uh, It's right there. That makes it nice and easy. So if we go into this folder and we're gonna call it Overlays Relic Cape Gateway, what do they rename it to? Right. Snakey Wear Gateway Git version. All right, I'm guessing that gets replaced at compile. So in theory, that should be most of what you want. We'll want to do git add Snakeyware, and then if we go all the way back to the source here, git commit a m first and git push. This probably won't work because I haven't set my author. I might have done that globally though in previous messing around. No, oh, that looked really good. All right, that all committed. Now, one other thing uh, that I will show you is a really handy little trick that I found for actually debugging things. This might fail. I might have missed something in there. Who knows? But we'll go to this job and we'll just cancel the job that's running now. It's going to automatically run this job as soon as you commit that. I'm going to hit cancel. I'm going to go to the pipeline editor. And then I'm going to paste in uh, down here where it grabs the artifacts. Normally, it just grabs the kind of direct output. But I also want to grab the synthesis log. So if my Verilog is actually wrong, uh, I can see that. And when we commit these changes to the pipeline, it's all going to be good. And it's going to restart that job because we've modified the pipeline. So the last build job was cancelled. That skipped the pages, which is the second part of the pipeline. Now it started again. And you can click on this build job and have a look what it's doing as well. So we're just going to give this a moment whilst it steps through. It usually takes about four minutes. And then we'll have a look at the log. If it's wrong, we'll have a look at the log either way so you can see where it is and then we'll have a look at our code and see if it works. Alrighty, it's been a minute or two and we're back and I already know something's wrong because I only found 10 matching artifacts, which means something didn't go right. So now if we go into here, uh, we can have a look at this build job. We can browse what we got from this and I'm not even gonna look in the artifacts. I'm gonna go to that log file that I made sure we have access to. It better be in here. No, it's not. All right, so I've got something else wrong. I'm gonna have a quick dig. Might be a file that I missed including. Won't be a moment. So back here uh, in this uh, add cape.tcl, I missed something really obvious and didn't even think about it, but we have the wrong directory in there. So we wanna get rid of Verilog template and change that to snakeyware. That, that looks a bit better. Um, yeah. All right, uh, git commit, uh, look the wrong way around, uh, fix typo, yeah, push. What the hell did I just do? I think, uh, untracked files. That's also a really good point. Um, uh, There we go. I uh, didn't even add that in. So it didn't compile because Snakeyware didn't exist. And there's a compiler and now it's added things to it. So I'll pull that again, then I'll commit this to it. Um, so I hadn't added Snakeyware to it. And I will just quickly set this so it makes it a little bit easier. I'm just gonna use that same commit. See if it actually wants to pull this time. I'm not great at Git either, which is why this happens. There we go. Go 
Cool. So the step I would forgot is to rename, uh, to add the folder to the repo, and then also to do that rename in the TCL. So now that I've pushed that, that will immediately start building again, and we can keep an eye on that. And you see it, page has failed that finished in 56 seconds, which means it didn't actually finish properly. And the synthesis, synthesis folder was empty without the logs because it didn't even get to synthesizing what we wanted. In fact, did I even put the right folder in there? Yeah, that's right. So I put a, I put a star there and that seems to work just regardless of what your, um, your project name is or your, uh, very long name is. So we'll give this one another minute and keep an eye on it. See how it goes. All right, so this is finished now and you can actually see we've got 17 artifacts. That's that's kind of a good look. That's what you want to see. Um, you can see we've got some more files in here as well. So let's quickly go have a look at that. Uh, we can just hit browse over there and I'll show you what those logs look like. So if you are trying to sh troubleshoot something going wrong, you don't get this by default. You've got to add that pipeline uh, editor line to include these files, but I find it so, so very handy. This is what you want here. It opens in a new tab and you can see the full synthesis for what uh, what you've done. And what you can usually do is just look up, say, at W to find any warnings. And if something is busted, you'll have some at ease, some errors. Uh, this looks really good though. This actually compiled. So if we go back now to where we were, uh, build artifacts, there we go. We can grab this link and go wget, uh, yeah, I think it's capital O, we'll find out in a sec, it was, and that is downloading. So this is gonna have the logs in it and everything as well, but we mostly just want the, um, the bitstream that's been synthesized now. So unzip that and we can see there, uh, Have I missed something? No, that is right, all right. When I was tinkering before, I actually ended up changing the name of this. So what you can do, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, it just really stopped me for a tick. Um, so we can go user share B, ooh, now that that's there, sudo user share B uh, gateway change gateway. And then we're in the folder, so my custom FPGA design. TMPWD, and now essentially what this script does are two separate calls. The first call, if you have a look at the script file, uh, is just to update the device tree to show the right information, but then it grabs your bitstream, writes it to a special bit of uh, memory, and then calls a kernel argument that's enabled by uh, the debug mode. And then this is essentially going to um, flash it and reboot, so if we enable this now, it usually takes about a minute, uh, but when it boots back up, the Polify is essentially gonna read that bitstream that we just stored in some memory, I believe can through SPI, uh, could be wrong there, and actually kind of burn our new digital circuit into the FPGA fabric. So let's just watch this for the next 60 seconds or so, and if everything went right, we should get one of those LEDs blinking. And it should be blinking about two hertz because it was every uh, what, 23 clock cycles. There we go. And as best I understand, this is a 50 megahertz clock. So we have our little two hertz blinky there. I want to go a little bit further though. I want to make this a little bit more fun and interesting. I want to make that thing called snaky that I told you about. So we're going to change this just slightly, fairly quickly, and I'll explain a bit more. Don't forget that at the end, I will be doing that giveaway of the Tang 9Ks with LCD screens. Um, you can do some really fun, cool stuff with those. So hang around till then. Right now, we're gonna wait for this to boot back up. That was nice and quick. And if you're curious, I'm just using the um, solarized dark theme and I'm using the Intel One Mono font because I find it really, really easy to work with. Now, Blinky can go away for a tick. We've got some more coding to do. If we go back into our sneakyware and then go sources, FPGA design, script support, components, tape, snaky. Uh, in here, 
we're going to want to change a few things. So first of all, let's go into the HDL Cape module. Um, we're going to want to hijack a few more things in here and we're going to have to see if I can get this right off the top of my head because I'm actually a bit sick at the moment, uh, unfortunately. So I'm going to want an array of 11 wires that I'm going to call LEDs instead of blink. So let's go and change that everywhere it needs to be. We won't worry about that now. That's going to be called LEDs and that's going to be called LEDs. Align it and we're going to do something a little bit different here. We're actually going to grab the first 11 um, wires. So we don't need any of that crap. We're actually going to go 11 bits of enable. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And we have to, uh, that'll be too long to fit in. So, okay, yeah. Uh, so the, the top 16 bits are used by something else. They're used by, um, I forget, go have a look at the diagrams. So we have zero to 10, which is 11 bits of one. And then 11 and upwards is gonna be whatever it was before. We're gonna do the same thing here, LEDs. And you can see before we already made LEDs 11 long. So instead of just grabbing one, we're grabbing 11. And then in here, uh, actually one more thing. I'm gonna rename it. I don't want it to be called Blinky. I want it to be called Snakey. And I mean, honestly, you can call the instantiated module whatever you want. Doesn't matter unless you're referring to it somewhere else. So if I now go into our Snakey Wear, I'll get rid of that because I don't care about it and call it Snakey. And the input is gonna be called LEDs. It's also gonna be a bit longer. So it's gonna be that same 11. I'm gonna space these out so that it looks nice. And ooh, that should work. I mean, you can add the keyword reg here, which some instructions I've read before tells you to do. We'll try it without. I don't think it's gonna matter. Um, I don't even actually know what it does. If you do wanna know, uh, go to that Skillshare link below and learn more about digital circuits. It might even cover it in there. I don't think they do much Verilog, but it came up when I did a search. Now, we want to create a wire. We're going to call this called uh, tick, and we're going to make it equal counter uh, equals five. Put mm, on over two hertz now. Fifty hertz. Yeah, fifty. No, we're going to do 5 million. So it should be 10 times a second considering the clock that we're getting uh, is 50 hertz. So what this is doing is tick is always going to be true if these evaluators is true. Next, we're going to want to make this counter a bit bigger. Um, 24 bits should fit what we want in and we'll default this to zero. We'll also add a semicolon there. And we're going to add one more. This one we're calling direction. And we're going to also make that default to zero. Now, we don't need to do that. We're going to start working kind of directly with the LEDs. Um, my personal preference is also to have the begin up there. It just feels nicer. You can also do the end else begin. And like you don't need as much indenting then. That looks nicer to me, that feels good. Now, a few things we're gonna wanna do now. If it's reset, uh, counter needs to be reset. You can simplify that one a little bit. You can just reset it to zero like that. Most synthesizers are gonna figure that one out. I want the LEDs to have a specific value. Let's go 11 bits. Zero, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And that is our snake. That's our unmoving snake. And direction, now this is where it gets interesting. I'm gonna direction equals not direction. So every time we smash that reset button, don't forget to smash like and subscribe by the way, especially if you're this far into it. Subscribe for more stuff that like this, but if you're enjoying this tutorial, if you're still watching, just hit like. It actually really helps me. So thank you in advance for that.
So every time it resets, it's gonna set the snake back to how it was. It's gonna flip the direction and it's gonna reset the counter. Now, if we're not resetting, we're gonna to have to do some other stuff. First up, if it's a tick, we want to then test if we're going in that direction. If we're going, if, you know, if direction's true, we're gonna to assign to LEDs, uh, this is a cool little trick, uh, itself, but slightly mangled. So we're gonna grab LEDs nine through zero, and then LEDs 10. So essentially we're pushing the last bit to the start, uh, kind of animating it in a loose way, if that makes sense. And as I said before, because this is that nice and short and simple, we don't even need that. We can then just go else. If not direction, so if we've changed the direction by hitting the reset button, LEDs is the concatenation of LEDs zero and then LEDs uh, 10 through one, if I've gotten that right off the top of my head. So this will move it in one direction, that will move it in the other. Yeah, that that should be right, that tracks in my brain. Um, now, either way, because we've ticked, we do need to reset counter to zero again here. Um, that basically means, you know, the ticks are gonna keep going up because of this until, the counter's gonna keep going up until it hits a tick. That's gonna cause this to happen because of this uh, comparison up here. And then we're gonna action. Now we do, actually need to add one other thing. So end, else, begin. All right, that should be right. Let's just follow that logic for a tick and follow our indents. Yeah, that, that's looking happy to me. So if we reset, reset everything and swap the direction. If we're not resetting, then if we're ticking, we're moving depending on the direction and resetting the counter because we ticked. If we're not ticking, then we're just incrementing the counter. So at a cursory glance, that is correct. I could have missed something daft like a semicolon, but that all looks good to me. I'm using the non-blocking assignments. Uh, all the indentations match. So we should be quite right. Just to go git, ooh. Yeah, that should be right. Let's see if it compiles though, because I might've got something right. The idea is I want a snake of five LEDs that runs across all 11 LEDs that we have on this board here. Um, so you still still got the six LED blink in the middle. Those other three won't be used because we did hijack all of those pins. So let's go to our build now and look at the jobs. The last one took a bit longer than I expected. I was already there. Uh, took five minutes. So we'll give this job five minutes and we'll see if it fails or if it passes. And if it passes, we'll grab that artifact zip file, do the same thing again, and um, see if we got a snake. Hold tight. All right, so it failed pretty quickly. Uh, only 11 matching artifacts, but we've got some logs here, so I can probably go and have a look at um, what I got wrong or what failed there. And it usually fails about the one minute mark, so you don't have to wait a huge amount of time. This is what we want. Now let's search for the at E. There we go. All right, so um, I do actually need that assignment to be type reg. The lines don't make sense though. Um, it might be skipping empty lines. I'm not too sure, but you can see it's definitely in my sneaky wear. And you know, at line 13, it's trying to do something with it. It's referring to LEDs, so. Maybe the lines are right this time. Uh, that should be it. Git com. I think you also only have to do the git pull that first time. Um, it seems like the, oh, that could have been because I edited the pipeline and it's pulling that pipeline file down. Um, That'll make sense. So that should be building now and it should last longer than that last one did, which is here. 
So that last one failed a minute six in. We'll give this a hot minute or maybe five and see if we get our artifacts or our bit streams at the end. It's probably worth noting that if you're connected over Wi-Fi instead of LAN, like I'm over LAN, so it's fine, but if it's over Wi-Fi, um, the first time you flash the new bit stream that you built, you're gonna lose your Wi-Fi connection and that's because of this. So um, if you wanna keep Wi-Fi, the build's gonna take longer each time, but you can just go M2 option default. And then uh, the bitstream that you get is going to include the FPGA uh, kind of code or wiring for the M2 to work, which is where the Wi-Fi interface is. I don't need that at the moment. I know it works, so I've just left that out. How's that going? Still going. Excellent. That's a good sign. It's now been, it says 2 minutes 21 seconds, 2 minutes 26 seconds. So I'd say that was the only typo. Won't be long. All right. That completed and we have our 17 artifacts again. So this is job 23384. What you can just do is go 23384 in that same URL, grab those artifacts again, download them nice and fast. Then unzip, this time we do minus O to override them. And we can do sudo user share beagle that one that one uh gateway builds tester artifacts bit streams my custom fpga design so now if i got all of that right we're going to flash this it's going to reboot and we're going to have a little snake running at uh what would that be about 10 hertz across those leds then when we smash the reset button it should start going the other way. So let's give this a hot minute, see what happens, and hopefully we have a snakey. All right, it's rebooting. The LEDs are gonna stop doing anything whilst it's writing to the FPGA. And this bit takes 30 to 60 seconds. I should time it, but I didn't. Snakey, look at it go. Now, you can make it go faster or slow if you want just by changing how many counts it takes to tick. But that is working. And now in theory, oh, oh, if I can stop knocking stuff, there we go. It goes the other way when you hit the button. It's a bit dicky. I'm not debouncing it at all. So, you know, the button might not be perfect, but that makes me so happy. So there is actually a lot of things you can do, but what Verilog is doing is connecting the wires and the logic in the FPGA fabric um, which ultimately connect to these based on the, the, the counting and whatnot that we're doing. And that um, CAPE module connects to heaps, as you can see in that code, that connects you know, to all of these uh, CAPE headers, the P9 and P8 headers. Um, so there is a lot you can do with this. If you consider that these CAPE headers are Im implemented in FPGA, the M2 interface is, the MIPI CSI is, um, you can access a lot of stuff. So it's really powerful and you're not just programming, you're actually designing a processor, an IC at that point. You can design things as simple as a 555 circuit up to an entire RISC-V processor and running that on the FPGA is what's called a soft core. So I might do that at some point and then you know demonstrate a few different things that can be done, but it depends how much you like this video. If you did like it, if this gets a lot of likes or thumbs up or views, I'll probably do more FPGA stuff because I'm really enjoying it. And that's why I've ordered some more, like those Tangs. Um, so if you want one of these Tang Nano 9Ks, I'd love to work with you guys on doing some fun stuff with them, especially because they've got HDMI and uh, I'm gonna, I've am i got the ones with a little um, one point something inch LCD. So to win one of these, all I want you to do is play a bit of a Kinesian Beauty contest. I want you to comment what you would do with it. And then I want you to upvote any comments of other people's suggestions that you like. So the only way you can win is by having a really good one, but I want you to help other people win too. It's a, it's a cool little trick. And I'll put a link to the Wikipedia article about the Canadian Beauty Contest too, because the, the concept behind it is really quite neat. But for now, that's it. That shows you how to make your own snakey. You'll be able to access this repo if you want to grab anything from it, because it is completely open to everyone. And I can't wait to hear what you want to do with your Cypede Tang Nano. I can't wait to play with it myself. So like, thumbs up, 
Uh, check out the Skillshare link that I'll put a link to, uh, the Skillshare Masterclass on Digital Logic that I'll put a link to below. It will help you do these things. It'll help that creator. It'll also help this channel. And I also want to say, if you're into learning new stuff, uh, especially if you want to get into robotics and programming and uh, Arduino, Electro have some really cool stuff. And I'll put a link, an affiliate link to their store below as well, because they've got all these starter kits in robotics and they've sent me one that I'm going to do in a future video. Uh, but they've got all these kits for robotics that's great for kids, you know, ages probably five and up. Um, and their Crowtail kits do all sorts. They've got heaps of little Arduino modules that they've made as well. And they're all really well priced. So I would recommend supporting them. They're a lovely bunch of people that make some cool indoor gardening stuff too, which is how or why I really got into them. But, you know, they're, they're building kits for education. And that's pretty sweet. I really appreciate that. So... I'll catch you guys in the next video. I'm probably going to start releasing them weekly now as well because I've got that much of a backlog to get through. But I look forward to hearing back, as I said, and I hope you're all doing well. Till next time, cheers.